Welcome to the Next Level American Dream podcast, brought to you by Thompson Multifamily Group. Your hosts, Abigail and Sean, will discuss how you can take your American dream to the next level through real estate investing, business practices, and personal development. Join us as we share our experiences as a father-daughter duo who are trying to accomplish their goal of financial freedom. We hope you learn more about how to define and achieve your American dream. Here's another episode of Next Level American Dream. On today's episode of Next Level American Dream, we are going to dive into the topic of trusts. Joining us is CJ Matthews and Robert Bernard. They are the co-founders of YourSmartWealth.com, a national program and podcast created to teach small business owners and entrepreneurs how to grow their business profits and retire faster, smarter, and wealthier. We learned so much from our conversation with them, and we can't wait to share it with you. Hi, CJ and Robert. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. How are you? We're great. So we're just going to jump right in, but I wanted to ask a little bit more about your business background. So you guys have just started doing multifamily real estate investment, and you're now doing a business education podcast. Could you guys tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, absolutely. So I started in real estate about about 2002, and I was doing single family flips and uh, was heavily involved with single family for the last 20 years or so. Um, taking them over and, you know, stopping the foreclosures and doing stuff like that. But really, I've always wanted to get into multifamily. I mean, that's really where it was for me because I knew that it was more passive. There's just bigger numbers and more leverage to be had. So that's that's really what it was for me. So I had gotten into real estate in 1998, 99, and have done a series of different things depending on what was working at the time. Because as you know, real estate goes through cycles did single family. Currently, I'm doing a lot of assisted living and raising of money syndication. And when Robert and I uh, got together for this, we both wanted to do apartments. That was a long-term play for us. We were very interested in that. So that's how we ended up here. Yeah. And then we started a podcast, (laughs) which is kind of our our love right now. So that is called Your Your Smart Smart Wealth. Wealth. And, dot com. That's right, dot com. And it's for small business owners who basically want to uh, supercharge their financial engine and uh, basically be able to achieve financial freedom. So we're teaching them financial freedom and uh, the tools that are just available to small business owners. So that's really kind of cool and that's our specialty. And uh, we're also teaching them to invest in, in real estate. That's good, yeah. Yeah, awesome. That's an amazing tool or amazing thing to do. Uh, so today we're going to talk about trust and and how they can be used to work with your real estate investments, things like that. So can you kind of just tell us first, what is a trust? Sure. So a trust is really a contract between the trustee and the beneficiaries. And the beautiful thing about that contract is that it does not need to be recorded anywhere on public record. So it is a way of actually not allowing the public to know who actually controls that trust. And that's what that means for you is, basically that you have a lot more protections. It becomes a lot harder for not only frivolous lawsuits, but lawsuits that someone wants to bring against you just for whatever reason. And it's a huge advantage of trusts, especially when you're working in real estate. Yeah, it's just another way of holding a piece of property or anything for that matter. You can put a car in a trust. I've placed a boat and RVs in trusts. So, you know, it's basically even bank accounts. And you can even do your own personal pet in a trust as well. So uh, Spot could have his own. Could have his own trust. So, you know, and if Spot ever bit anybody and they came to sue you, all they'd get is Spot. You just hand the leash over and say, here you go because you don't personally own the spot the trust does. So that's, that's kind of an advantage to trust is that it separates all of your assets out so that even if one gets sued, the rest don't get infected and affected, so to speak. I'm not sure about handing over spot. <laughs> I'd be a little worried about that. Well, <laughs> that's the, I guess you could do cattle cattle in a trust? You could. You could. You could Any you, kind of valuable item. Yeah. And there's really two different types of trust that, that uh, I use. One's a real estate trust and uh, that's f- obviously for real property. And then another is for personal property, which is pretty much everything else. 
So there's a, I guess there's a revocable and an irrevocable trust. Do you know, can you explain the difference between those two and how they relate to real estate? Yes. Yeah, so mostly we, we always use revocable trusts uh, about 99% of the time. And that's because if you ever want to take the property and sell it again, you need to be able to pull the property out of the trust. And that's, allows, what, that's what's allowed with a revocable trust. An irrevocable trust is kind of once it goes in, it stays in, you know, until there's, there are certain criteria which you can come out, but basically it's meant to stay, you know, you, you, you put it in the, in the trust and stays there forever. Yeah. And also I know with real estate, we also, my side of things is also from your personal wealth standpoint, quite often you want to put your personal wealth into trust. That's a big thing. And it's not just one trust. It can be several trusts, but many times once you pass on, you want some control over that to make sure, let's say you have a spendthrift child or a spendthrift spouse. One of the things that you want to do is make sure that they can't spend it down. And so what you, what you do with that is you also, once you pass on, it becomes irrevocable. So it's a revocable trust until you pass on. So it's also another technique for helping out with making sure that your legacy remains in uh, good standing. Yeah. And that would be a living trust. That would be, uh, that's a classic example of a living trust right there yeah. mm -hmm. is that it turns into a uh, irrevocable after you pass on. Yes. So what so, else about that? The, the other beautiful thing about trust is that it, there's no uh, probate, that it instantly transfers from one generation to the next without going through probate. So in the moment you pass away, it goes directly to the next beneficiaries, the successor beneficiaries. And if you're really fancy you and have grandchildren, it, you can skip a gen. Yes. Yeah, skip a gen on that. That's, that's advanced stuff, but just you know, ideas to start thinking about and researching. Yeah, especially if you want to avoid taxes and stuff like that. There's all sorts of trusts that are around that. Mm -hmm. um, but today we're just going to kind of keep it simple I and just talk, <laughs> just take, talk about real estate and talk about some asset protection. Oh, and we should also say we are not lawyers. We are not CPAs. We do not play them on TV, although I would love to. <laughs> so if you know of anybody who's looking for uh, a role, <laughs> I keep saying I'd love to play that on TV. <laughs> anyway. Well, the, well tell, tell us a little bit about how – I guess you guys touched on some of it now, but how does the trust work exactly? Uh, so let's say you, you wanted to buy a piece of property or you, you own a piece of property and you want to protect it. But the, the purpose of the trust is sort of protect it from what? Sure. So the, the purpose of the trust is basically to protect it from frivolous lawsuits, like CJ said. And what you would do is when you went to go buy the property, you'd actually put it in the name of the trust and, and designate who the trustee is at that point. Okay. And ideally you want to use a trustee who lives out of state, who is just kind of, and use their initials, right? So you just don't want to make it easy for someone to find them. There's a thing called doctrine of latches, which basically says if you can't find them within two years, just get sued. then the kind of the lawsuit goes away. So someone's going to have to spend 10 to $20,000 to make sure this lawsuit sticks. So that's how it'll kind of eliminates frivolous lawsuits. But once it's in the trust, then the beneficiary directs the trustee basically to maintain the property, sell the property. The, the trustee could hire whomever they want to basically manage the property. So you could theoretically be the beneficiary and the manager of the property at the same time and not own the property directly. So it's sort of the uh, own nothing but control everything kind of. Exactly. Or, yes. I love that. It's, yeah. It's super important. I think as a lot of people get into real estate to understand you can go and you can buy something, but real estate is one of the highest classes of classes, lawsuits. Yeah. Classes of lawsuits. So you're not trying to get out of anything or weasel out of anything, but you're also not looking for any con men to make it. Eat. You don't want to leave your door unlocked, so to speak, at least have a deadbolt and and a regular lock on your uh, door of protection. And so I think that's super important that people realize that you're not trying to avoid responsibility at all. You're just trying to avoid what we are in a litigious society here so that you can function and all your hard work isn't taken away by some con man that comes in and sees that you're not well protected. Yeah, you know, the, and insurance should pay out. You should definitely have insurance and that should cover any you know accidents or liability right and it should just end there and as my mentor uh, about trust said once is that you know trust level the playing field basically if if you if you run into somebody 
and they don't have, uh, and, uh, or if somebody runs into you and they don't have anything, you don't get anything. But if you run into somebody, you have everything, they get it all. So with trust is that you don't own anything either. So you just look as poor as everyone else on paper. So that's kind of the beauty of trust is it takes everything out of your um, possession, basically. Right. And the purpose of it is to also, I guess, in, in the States and, and transferring the ownership of things pretty seamlessly. Like you said, there's no probate to those uh, estates as they transfer to the, to the heirs and things like that. So that's a secondary, I guess, reason for using trust. Yes, secondary. Yeah, there are really about 20 different reasons, but that's probably one of the biggest ones. Yeah. I mean, you can save th literally thousands and thousands hundreds, of dollars. I'm going to say hundreds of thousands. Yeah, if your estate's big enough. I Or the value of the property. Because uh, years ago, I inherited and I had to sell the house to pay the taxes because the house was in California. It was in San Francisco. It was over a million dollars and there was really not much else cash that I could use. So it, it forced me to have to sell. Had that house been in trust, it would have been a completely different story. And really, the beautiful thing about it is that you can actually sell the beneficial rights to the, to the trust. So the trust doesn't actually have to switch hands or anything. There's actually a town in California, I think it's Carmel by the sea, which almost nearly 100% of the houses are owned in trust. And people don't sell the property, they sell the beneficial rights of the trust. And that way, the, they don't have to pay the taxes on the, the transfer taxes. And no one has to know who's moving into that new house, you know, who's moving to that house. It uh, remains private. And, you know, they basically, their names are kind of kept off public record. Because so, they're all famous, very rich, and uh, need their privacy, and they had a good lawyer. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you can see that, you know, trusts really have been for the rich for a long time because, you know, no one really wanted to spend the money to learn about it. And no lawyer wants to kind of teach his clients unless they come to him or he's a, you know, they're going to write a big check. So it's not been typically for the typical uh, person. I mean, the living trusts have kind of come around. They've yeah. been, they've been much more prevalent, but putting everything in trust like cars separately and bank accounts separately, that's really for people that are kind of up either on the income scale or they know what they're looking for in terms of asset protection. And however, you know, you were buying the knowledge, the paperwork itself. You, you are buying the knowledge and making sure that you know how to do it. And there are ways of learning that yourself besides getting a consultation or going to an attorney for that information. There's not, and what's interesting is there are still not a lot of people who teach this. No, no, they're not. And attorneys really don't want you to know because they want to be able to sue. If everyone had everything in trust, they wouldn't be able to sue anybody. So that whole litigious you know, tort thing would kind of go away in the real estate world. <laughs> and, the, and that wouldn't be very good for business. So yeah. just saying. Yeah. And, and so there's places to learn it. It's yeah. The, is there a problem with, so if you own a piece of property in a trust, is there a problem with insurance or maybe refinancing with a bank or, you know, any of those types of things that those come up? Challenges. Yes. 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 So there are. So refinancing with a bank, Yes, you actually most of the time have to pull it out of uh, the trust for even 30 days or so to get it refinanced and then you can place it back in the trust. So that is one of the issues and that does leave a permanent trail as to who, you know, who might be the beneficiary and who took the loan out. So that is one thing is that it's not always easy to refinance inside of a trust. The other thing is insurance. It does cost a little bit more, but, you know, p peace of mind if you want to sleep at night you know, and not have to worry about your stuff, you know, if you're sued or not. So, and, you know, even having the cars in a trust, the cost a little more with insurance, but, but I always found it to be worth it. I mean, I just, you know, I really wanted to have peace of mind. So yes. Yeah. Look, if you're driving an $8,000 car and you have a $125,000 house and it is all you have, it's probably worth it because by removing that, it may be difficult for you to rebuild. Now, if you're somebody who has five houses you definitely need it. So there's not a time for me to say you shouldn't get it. It just all depends on affordability for you. And to me, I think, and you probably do too, almost everything should just be in a trust. Just assume that's part of the cost of doing not only business, but living. And it's getting easier and easier to get those as more people get educated about it and hear about it. And I, I just, I feel strongly about that. It's, I, and I'll tell you, I did not have that many trusts before, 
But with Robert, after hearing some of the stories and with his expertise, I'm like, everything, put it all in there, you know? Yeah, like I literally don't own anything. I mean, the computer, my phone, even my clothes, they're all in trust. I mean, I really, as a human being, don't literally try and own anything. And yeah, it does take some work. You have to create a list of everything and, and kind of have a bill sale showing it that it went to a trust. But once it's done, it's done. And, you, you know, I update it every once in a while. But, you know, that's kind of our philosophy. And really, I think if you're driving the $8,000 car, you probably need to trust more than $125,000 car because the brakes are worse on the $8,000 car and you're more likely to kill somebody. And, or, hurt, or hurt somebody. Yeah. Or, I mean, yeah. this is... That's wow, the, you went really deep there. I know. But that's, that's the myth is that people think that when you have an expensive car is when you put it in a trust. And no, it's both cars, unfortunately, if, you, you know, if you're not paying attention, if you have that slight notice, can, both cars can kill somebody. And really, it's not the value of the car. It's the fact that it's, you know, it, it can potentially cause injury. And that's really what, what you want to look at. So, and okay, you know why? So I'm to, yeah, I'm starting to get it. So uh, the trust is used as sort of a risk mitigation tool, not necessarily just against physical lawsuits, but also against just just anything really that, that can and, and get you end up in, in court, I guess, right? Is that what you're you're saying? Exa- right. Exactly. I mean, that's like I'm. That's why I mentioned the dog. I mean, a Fido, not Spot, but a Fido was a very <laughs> aggressive dog. It bit somebody or someone else's dog, right? And and you were to get sued over that, it, you know, it basically it's like the lizard losing its tail, right? You could lose the tail and still carry on. You know, the lizard still keeps walking away, right, and having a life, and it, you know, just lost one piece. So the more you can separate or separate, uh, separate. That's separate. A new word. I yeah. like it. Separate. I, separate, separate, and yeah. bifurcate your assets. The better off you'll be. I think I'm going to write that word down. I like it. Okay. Yeah. So I guess uh, one thought came came to mind. So I most of my real estate is, is held in LLCs or you know some sort of entity, and I think I get a lot of the same protections that you would get uh, from a trust. Maybe not. I guess I would be. There's a path to to who owns the LLC. So that people could find out who eventually owns the property, but how would how would a trust be different or ben- more beneficial than just owning your property in a in an entity? Ah, okay. So I love this answer, by the way. Okay, <laughs> I love this. Okay. Okay. One is that with an LLC, you somebody to sit around to get to get served in a lawsuit. Okay, your registered agent is basically sitting there waiting around for someone to serve them. That's why when the LLC was created, they set up the resident agent so the attorneys could sue. Okay. Now you also, you could lose what's ever inside that LLC is at risk. So if you had all of your, if you had more than one house in in an LLC, then all those houses that are inside an LLC are at risk. And the other thing that I want to say is that there was actually a lawsuit in Massachusetts where uh, a landlord had 50 different houses and 50 different LLCs. And because the paperwork wasn't kept up perfectly for each LLC, the judge pierced the corporate veil of all those and the the plaintiff basically was able to recover all 50 houses in their lawsuit. So you, the two things, I mean, LLCs, one is that you have to pay every year to keep them on public record and you have to maintain the records impeccably. If you screw up in any way, shape or form, you know, basically your corporate veil is, is could be pierced. So with a trust, you could set it up. Look, my favorite trustee is a married woman out of state, okay? And I like to use her maiden name, all right? That maybe hasn't been on record for 20 years, right? Like no one has seen that name and I like to use initials. It's going to take a good, like I said, 10 to $20,000 to find that person. So you, the chances of them, you know, of being sued is much lower because usually when when attorneys go in and they type in the trust, they're going to see who the trustee is because that's technically owns the property and that's technically needs to be served as the trustee. And if they're a county or two away, not, we're not even talking the state, right? If they're a county or two away, the, 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 uh, the attorney who might be on the contingency fee might go, well, you're going to have to write me a check because I'm going to need to hire a private investigator to find that trustee and get them served. And then here's the beautiful part is that you could fire that trustee. Like if you know that lawsuit's coming, you could just fire that trustee and have a successor trustee in place. So when they go knock on that trustee's door and they go to serve the lawsuit, it's like, well, I'm not the trustee anymore. And they're like, well, who is the trustee? And they could be like, well, I don't know. And then they have to kind of start over again. So you don't have to make it easy for anybody is what I'm saying with trust. And that's the difference between an LLC is that 
you kind of got your hand waving like, hi, ah, here, sue me versus a trust, which can be very private and very elusive. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, don't make it these. easy. Don't leave the door unlocked, right? They can find your address. The door is unlocked. When, when you're looking at, again, you just want to lock and bolt that front door. You don't want people just to be able to walk in, which is kind of what an LLC does. They don't randomly pick you. They, you know, as a place to rob, they just can like, oh, I'm just going to try all the doors and oh, look, this door is unlocked. Yeah. So I think the biggest benefit to a trust would be to, for personal property, obviously, for avoiding probate issues and then for long term hold type property. So if you're, if you're planning on just buying and flipping a house and it's going to take you less than a year, a trust probably isn't something that you want to bother creating. But if you're going to buy and hold that property indefinitely, uh, a trust may be something that would be beneficial, right? Yeah, and I would I would uh, caution probably putting a like a large multifamily inside of a trust though. I know it's kind of going backwards, only because if you want to sell that again, someone's going to want to see the LLC. But you're right. If you're going to just you know keep it in there forever, then a trust would be a good way to do it. You know, and the pro and the only other issue really we talked about that kind of before, which I didn't answer was that if you go to sell the property, you got to make sure the trustees there at the closing table. You have to make sure that all the paperwork is being filled out and everyone's really happy with the, with the trust, with the, you know, the trustee and stuff like that. So you just want to make it easy at closing time with trusts. But if you were like a, um, if you were a, a, an investor that had four or five rental properties, or rental houses, let's say just single family rental properties, a trust for each one might be, it might be a good idea. Oh, absolutely. For sure. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And your, your LLC could be the beneficiary. You could start with an LLC and then have the LLC place the property into a, in a trust for estate planning purposes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So in that case, if you were just someone that had four or five rental properties and uh, you were trying to insulate yourself from litigation, but also you wanted to facilitate that ease of, uh, ease of airship, that it would do both things for that person, I guess. It would be a very good tool. So. Yeah, absolutely. So where would someone, where, where would you start to kind of get, if, you, if let's say, let's say I want to put my property in a trust, what, where do you guys suggest that someone kind of start that process? Would they contact an attorney? Are there resources online or, or how does that sort of, so can someone get started with it? So if you, if you already know exactly what you want, um, going to specific attorneys, we've got a few that we would, you know, I don't want to say recommend, but encourage you to start out with because they understand this process. Also, you can hire a consultant. So like him. <laughs> so Robert, a lot of times it's a consultant. You know, we're very clear that he's not an attorney. He's just super, super, super well educated because that was his specialty, you know, with his MBA and taxes and things like that. This was just something that he learned how to do to protect all his properties as well and just became very good at it. So there's two ways of going. One is, you know, if you already know, at least find an attorney who gets how this works because some attorneys, yeah, they're trust attorneys, but they, but remember they had to get themselves educated as well. Uh, most of them just had one semester on it in law school. So they really don't know. If, my suggestion is that you get educated or you find someone to consult you or you take, a, you know, who, someone who knows. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the attorney to get the trust set up is that you direct how it goes. This is who I want as my trustee. This is my successor trustee. This is the paperwork that I want put on public record. I don't want the whole trust on public record. I just want the affidavit of trust put on public record. And, you know, there's I, little there's little lists like that. You know, we actually are putting together a class for that. I, we're not, I'm not here to promote it or anything like that. But all we're saying is that that class is coming up because we've gotten more and more people realizing that they need to do this. And there really is not a lot of places to go get educated on it. So that we feel that that's going to come out pretty quickly. And in the meantime, if you want a consultation, at least this is a good place for you to start. And we can give you guidance through that process. And when I say we, it's the royal we. <laughs> but if it, so let's say I'm let's say I'm here I'm here in, in the Dallas area, and, and I want to create a trust. It's, and an attorney may be where I would start. Are you looking for an estate attorney or a trust attorney specifically, or is there what's their specialization that you would look for? I would 
I would start with someone who does trust, a real estate attorney who does trust. That's where I would start because it's really going to be more likely your real estate properties. So real estate attorneys who have experience doing trust, I would probably contact your local RIA. There are probably people in that area that know of an attorney or two that handles closings and handles trusts and they could set it up. And then just and then just follow basically a few rules to get that, you know, to make sure the trust is not easily be suable and that it'll, you know, and that the beneficiary, the um, successor beneficiary statement is set up correct and how you want it. Also, you know, you can also go to, there are a lot of places that are real estate attorneys that they'll do the paperwork for you, but then have, uh, you know, they may be nationwide. So they'll do it for you and put it all together and then they'll contact an attorney in that state to to finish out the paperwork so to speak so there's also that option yes you know because i i have found that you're not always going to find the right person for what you're trying to do in your own backyard it'd be great and you know we're in las vegas so we've got a lot of high quality people here because a lot of people have their their businesses yeah, and things LLCs like that their so llc's out of here so you see a lot of professionals but there, i have an attorney in washington and she's awesome for the, this kind of thing she totally gets it and uh one out of southern california and that's just kind of when i need their services quite often we just go through them and whatever state we happen to be in that needs to be handled they usually have a connection for that to fi finalize out the paperwork so that's another option yeah, well, I'm just thinking for someone that's listening to this now and they're just locally, that, so they would want to start with probably a real estate attorney and then get an idea or a sense of what their background is or their strength is in trusts. Is so, I mean, not all real estate attorneys are going to be well-versed in doing the trust is what it sounds like. So you probably want to start with a real estate attorney and then say, hey, you know, I, I want to set up these trusts, kind of give me an idea of what your, what your ability is with those trusts, and then you can decide to use that person or not. And then are there any sort of online or uh, other resources where someone like me that's trying to do that uh, can go to make sure that they understand what to tell the attorney once they've come up with that? We should make a checklist for that. Yeah, I think we're going to develop a product around that uh, oh. to basically to, to help people. Yeah, because no, <laughs> there really there's really not a lot of information out there. And I'm not sure about the accuracy of that. It is. Yeah, there's there's maybe one guy out there that he teaches this, but he only offers it once a year. That's it. And I don't even think he does consultations. No, he doesn't. He's just like, you either come to the thing and you'll get it. And it's like, I think every September or something. So if you're here now waiting till September, that's too long. So yeah, I'm not, there's not, if any, any resources out on the internet for this particular thing. There are some people that, that might teach it. I just don't know what they're teaching necessarily, so I can't recommend anybody at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as long as someone starts with a local real estate attorney, if they have any, if that's possible, and then just kind of get a, uh, an idea of the strength of that attorney's uh, tr uh, trust experience, that, that would probably be a good place to get going, I would think. Yeah, and I like I said, I'd go to the local RIA, the Real Estate Investment Association, and yep. and ask around there. There will be somebody that that probably knows trust out of that. So. Especially the people who've been around for a while, they've yeah. probably gone through several attorneys trying to find the right one. So yeah, definitely ask for that. And they, I like local RIAs because they do always have a nice, steady group of people who have been successful, and quite often know or have a connection to somebody that can help them out right? or help you out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me when would someone, I guess we've talked about some of these issues already or some of these benefits of having a trust, but tell me when someone would definitely want to use a trust and then when someone would definitely not want to use a trust. So maybe question. the pros and cons, you know, if you have this situation, you've got to have a trust, you know, in your opinion. And, and if you're facing this, definitely don't use a trust. You can kind of give us the, pro, the, the high and low on, when to use one, when not to use one? Yes. So actually, <laughs> so the, the best time to use a trust is when you have low income residents and when you have high income 
residence, in, let's say in an, in an apartment or in a house, okay? Low-income people, they're trying to get money from someone else, so they tend to, to sue. The high-income people, they can afford really good attorneys and get your money, okay? So that is the, the general rule of like when you want to use a trust. I would say definitely for rental properties, um, using trusts are really important for any of your vehicles, a boat, cars, you know, any motorcycles, anything like that, I would, I would definitely put in trust. Where I wouldn't use a trust is for flipping houses. You, you're already taking out a loan typically with a hard money lender or something like that. It's just not worth having a trust because no one, no one should be living in the house and that should be secured enough where people can't take your tools and your supplies anyway to get into the house. And if there's like a playground on the back of the house, I would, I would take down the playground while I was rehabbing it just so it's not a, um, there's a term for like a nuisance, a public, you know, like a, yeah. So you basically um, wouldn't do it then. And also you'd want to keep your flipping business. This is for tax reasons. You wouldn't want to put it in a trust because you really want to keep your flipping business in a separate, separate area so that it doesn't influence your depreciation abilities. So anytime you have a short-term, anytime you have a short-term asset transfer, I guess, there's no real need to, to do a trust. It's just, it's just kind of a useless, it'd be useless of a function really. Yeah. Unless you really want to keep your name out of records. I mean, you know, if you're really paranoid about being on public record or your LLCs being on public record, if you, I mean, I would just probably buy things in the LLC in that case and just try and keep it out of your personal name. But I think, you know what, I, I want to ask a question about this because sure. it's not something we've gone in depth about, which is the depreciation portion. You know, like you've purchased something, you've purchased a house, and you still have depreciation rights on it, right? Oh, yeah. The the LLC or the trust is like a single, single member LLC. It's disregarded in terms of the IRS. So you have 20, 20 different trusts, but essentially they'd all collect up to one Schedule E so that you only have one tax ID number for all those trusts, okay? It's like they don't even exist to the IRS. So, and that depreciation would pass up through you as well, similar to a, like an S Corp or whatever. So yes, that's the beautiful thing is the trusts just are, are beautiful for that as well. I so, love it when you talk taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, you're so sexy. <laughs> the, the trust, uh, the benefit goes to the beneficiary, the tax benefit goes to the, the depreciation benefit goes to the beneficiary of the trust. That's correct. Yep, that's yeah. correct. Yep. Okay. All income proceeds and avails go to the, the, the beneficiary. So here's, a, here's another interesting cool fact is if you are sued and the judge says turn over the beneficial interest of the property of the real estate to uh, someone else and you are still in control of the trust, right, then you can spend – doing repairs for the next 20 years and make it the most beautiful house ever and they don't see a dime of income so just i mean you know like those things are all possible to make it as unattractive to sue you <laughs> like once the attorney realizes what they're going to get into in terms of not getting a dime if it's a contingency then then they're not going to be very uh excited to go go after you yeah wow this was so educational for both of us i think yeah. That was incredible. But our final thought and one of our biggest themes of our podcast is taking the American dream to a whole nother level. So I just wanted to ask, what does the American dream really mean to you guys personally? Straight up for me, $500,000 a year. Uh, impassive. impassive income. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> impassive income. Don't be That's super important to stay. <laughs> if you're going to be working 80 hours a week for that. Yeah, I know. Right. So yeah, that's, I mean, to me, that's the American dream because it, it allows me to do all the things I love to do, which is like travel and, and fun things like that, you know, and security and healthcare and all the things that we worry about when we go to sleep at night. And, and then a little extra left over for the future. So, yeah, that's my American dream, believe it or not, is that I, I'd like to get to that place. I'm about halfway there, not quite, or was. <laughs> and then, so that's for me. Yeah. How about you? What's yours? Um, I mean, mine really is, well, my financial goal is 1.5 million a year uh, in passive income. <laughs> I um, love it. You know, for because <laughs> of inflation. 
and really, I mean, I really want to be a, a jet setter. I really want to own my own corporate jet. I worked as an aerospace engineer or a, as an aerodynamicist at Cessna Aircraft Company. And I saw these business jets going out the door and I was like, that's, that's my goal. That's my dream. I like to leave my daughter really well set up for the future. So future generations don't have to worry about, about surviving or making an income and, you know, basically have the freedom to do what I want, where I want, with whom I want and, and, you know, enjoy life and then leave a legacy for the next 300 years where, I mean, personally, like the environment's important to me. So I want to leave money to that and, and those sort of things. So, That's, yeah, you're really so supportive on a daily basis. Like everything <laughs> has to be recycled. And look, I'm totally, I think it's lovely. However, for him, it really steps into the place that his American dream is to be, help make a difference in not only in the environment, but also people's housing. I mean, he talks about it all the time. Mine's just, you know, I guess I'm just sort of self-centered. <laughs> I was an only child. That was my problem. Uh, I understand. <laughs> That's fantastic. Right? Right. I'm going gonna, gonna to add on to that just a little bit. You guys kind of touched on it slightly, but now that you have defined what the American dream means to you, how do you think you're currently taking that to the next level? Like what action steps are you taking to level uh, up? And oh, the action oh, steps. Yeah. The action steps. Uh, so for us right now, it's building this podcast is mm -hmm. that we really want to teach, you know, uh, probably about a thousand small business owners, you know, like doctors and chiropractors and dentists really to take their small business and move it up and then have them invest it with us, you know, have them ex invest, you know, hundred, hundred thousand or dollars. Yeah. To more. get them into real estate. Now there's some people out there that already do that, but it's on such a, it's a very small scale and we'd like to help people not have the golden handcuffs or the velvet handcuffs that people talk about where you're working and you're making just enough to be successful but not enough to have true freedom it's almost a little bit it becomes a chore because if you hiccup or sneeze or are down for three days all of a sudden your business uh, takes a tank and so it's almost like a, your own insurance by having real estate and so we would love to be supportive to people who want to do that business owners are really the people who especially smaller business owners are stuck without all the benefits that everybody else has you know they have to pay for their own insurance they if they're sick the business stops running most of the time you know little things like that 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 are easily fixable with passive income and we'd like to be the ones who help them do that and they also have huge advantages of being a small business owner that no one else can take advantage of they have qualified retirement plans that no one else can do they can also use their business to maximize their tax deductions. So basically they're paying as little tax as possible. But that's also part of the other American dream for me is that I get to control how much taxes I pay. That's important for me as well. So I like that ability here in America. <laughs> that's so a, CJ and Robert, advantage. yeah. thank you guys so much for being here. And you guys are a depth of incredible knowledge. Is there a way for our listeners to get in touch with you guys or even just learn more about what you guys are doing as a company? Yes. So they can get a hold of us at team at yoursmartwealth.com. They can also visit um, our uh, website, website yep. yoursmartwealth.com. Yep. And then we also have a YouTube channel that we're putting up, uh, yoursmartwealth.com. And right now there's a the Your Smart Wealth Survival Guide to 2020 for small business owners that's up there now that people can go watch and get some ideas if they're small business owner how to survive in these economic times and thrive. Mm -hmm. Classic. And look, that's good for any time, really, yeah. um, but especially right now. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. We'll make sure to make that accessible to all of our listeners in the description and show notes. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes so everybody can find you guys. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks we appreciate for that. for coming on. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to come and do the show with us. And, you know, we're, we're new at this, so hopefully uh, hopefully it was a good experience for you. And, and I'm, I'm sure the listeners got some good information out of that. You know, trusts, are, trusts aren't well known, so... It's one of those small topics that can have big benefits. So I appreciate you guys sharing that with us. Well, we really appreciate you um, giving us this opportunity to share this with the world because, like we said, it it is a part of our piece. Even though we like making money, we also are very much into making sure people have enough information so they can make money too. And it's, you know, all ships what is it? All ships rise, rise on, the, on the tide? Yep, on the, Isn't that it? Yep. And we believe strongly in that. Excellent. Well, thanks for so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.
Thanks for joining us for another episode of Next Level American Dream. If you would like to learn more about what we talked about today, want to contact the team directly, or are interested in passively investing and being a part of our deal room, head over to our website at www.thompsonmultifamilygroup.com. Before you go, please leave a review. Your comments help us create more episodes for you to enjoy.